Hello, I'm Hannah Donnert with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chainjoy is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE partnership webinar, which is titled Climate Change and Air Pollution, Health Inequities, Global Premature Mortality, and Decarbonization Health Co-Benefits. Our moderator today is Ted Shetler, Science Director of Science and Environmental Health Network. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who call in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Ted. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah. And let me add my welcome to all of you who have joined us today. I'm going to uh, briefly introduce uh, our three speakers here at the outset, and then we'll move right into their presentations. And as Hannah mentioned, we'll have plenty of time at the end for uh, questions and answers and discussion. So our first presentation today is by Maria Cecilia Pinto de Moura, uh, Senior Vehicles Engineer in the Clean uh, Transportation Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. She conducts research on transportation, energy, and emissions in support of regional policy campaigns to reduce oil use and mitigate vehicle emissions. She holds degrees in electrical engineering, computer science, and energy planning and the environment. The second speaker will be Raquel Silva, who is an uh, environmental health scientist with a diverse background in environmental engineering, management, and policy, as well as experience in environmental modeling and data analysis. She holds a PhD in environmental sciences and engineering from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the third speaker will be Tony Wang, currently working at the California Air Resources Board as an air resources engineer. His work focuses on transportation and land use policies and their associated greenhouse gas reduction benefits. He, he earned his doctorate degree from UCLA's environmental science and engineering program. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Cecilia. Hi, thank you for inviting me. One of the main air pollutants is fine particular matter, smaller than 2.5 micrometers in diameter, called PM 2.5, 20 times smaller than even the fine, finest human hair. Ambient air pollution kills three to four million people worldwide per year and is estimated to be responsible for about 95% of these deaths. Here is a painting by the French Impressionist painter Claude Monet from 1901 depicting Sharing Cross Bridge in London through smog. We don't know what Monet knew about air pollution, but his depictions through smog are dramatic. The air was so thick that Londoners called it pea soup. In those days, most of the PM 2.5 that people breathe came from coal burning in houses for, for heat and cooking. PM 2.5 has complex origins, but we know that today transportation is one of its main sources. On average, in 2017, all of the country's transportation was responsible for 29% of the country's greenhouse gas emissions, and in some states, the share is much larger. So transportation emissions are a double-edged sword, with a large share of the responsibility for global warming and for local air pollution. With the growth of urbanization, many people today breathe PM 2.5 that originates in our road network. Over one quarter of the deaths from PM 2.5 are associated with transportation. Research links exposure to particular matter with increased illnesses and deaths, primarily from heart and lung diseases. The particles are small enough to penetrate deeply into the lungs. The smallest can even enter the bloodstream. So, in a recent study at the Union of Concerned Scientists, we focused on a source of PM 2.5 pollution that is near densely populated areas all over the country. 
our road network and its millions of cars, trucks, and buses. We mapped PM 2.5 concentrations at the ground level for each census tract in the country. We then combined that information with population and demographic data to understand how exposure to PM 2.5 varies across racial and ethnic groups and across locations. You can see from the map how PM 2.5 exposure varies greatly across the country. Zooming in to the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, by the way, that map um, that is being published in a blog and it's interactive, the national map. Um, I can give you the link afterwards. So zooming in here, we see that even more clearly the variability between the exposure in urban and rural areas of all states. Metropolitan areas in several states have many areas with pollution at least twice as high as the regional average. Here's a chart showing this variability. The blue dots are the state average, PM 2.5 concentrations. The horizontal lines are the range, not the error bars, the range, where the lowest pollution is on the left and the highest on the right. So as an example, New York State has the largest range, followed by Pennsylvania. These states have the most polluted areas in the region. The maximum of the New York range corresponds to New York City, specifically the West Bronx. I, by the way, Washington DC has the highest uh, uh, concentration, but it's totally urban. So the, the, I, I mentioned New York because it's the first state. So here's a chart finding with our main findings, the disproportionately high exposure for people of color in the region. The x-axis shows eight racial and ethnic groups and the y-axis shows PM 2.5 exposure. And so what did we find? Well, Latino residents and Asian American residents have exposures which are 40% higher relative to the regional average exposure. African American residents have 30% higher exposure. However, white residents have a 19% lower exposure. Another way to look at this inequitable exposure is shown in this chart. Each column refers to census tracts in areas with similar PM 2.5 pollution concentrations. The columns show the fraction of people belonging to each of eight racial groups living in these areas. The least polluted areas are on the left and the most polluted on the right. The column at the far right shows the region's average racial composition. The zero to 50% area, that's the column on the left, refers to census tracts where PM 2.5 is less than half the regional average. The 50 to 100% column refers to tracts where pollution is from half the regional average to the regional average, et cetera. So what's our conclusion? In areas where PM 2.5 exposure is low, the fraction of white residents is the highest, 85% for this region which is higher than the 65% average white composition of the region. As the analysis looks at more polluted areas, this fraction decreases. However, in the highest pollution areas, you will notice that the fraction of white residents is higher. This is because these are all urban centers with heavy traffic. And it's very important to note that these are average results, right? So profound inequities exist within urban areas as well that are not captured in this graph such as in the Bronx in New York City, Chinatown in Boston, and many other areas in the country. So I would like to take a little bit of time to talk about the challenges of our modeling. The main one is the complex origins of PM 2.5. It travels long distances and can have highly variable concentrations as we saw. Most of PM 2.5 comes from vehicle exhaust, tailpipes. But other compounds also come from the evaporation of gasoline during refueling and from leaks in vehicles, fuel tanks, and lines. And these compounds lead to the formation of secondary PM2.5 in the atmosphere. In fact, a large percentage of PM2.5 is formed from chemical and physical reactions of these various pollutant gases in the atmosphere. These are the so-called precursor emissions. And they include gases such as ammonia, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides, and volatile organic compounds. Our model took into account the location of the primary emissions as well as the precursor emissions from tailpipes and refueling. Other factors that matter are the height of emissions of the emission source, the weather and geographic patterns, all of which we took into account. Very important, we wanted to model the concentrations of PM2.5 at a high resolution at the census tract level. The model we use called InMap 
has a variable resolution computational grid, which allows the model to save time by focusing computational resources in areas where you know, the high spatial resolution is most useful, such as in urban areas, and the lower resolution in remote locations. Models of this kind with low computational intensity are really important tools because they're cheaper than the complex chemical transportation models and so can be used to inform air pollution policies. What factors determine the health impacts of PM2.5? First, the intake fraction. How much do people breathe? Are the emissions upwind from population centers? Are the emissions near densely populated areas? One study shows that one third of damages occur within eight kilometers of emission sources, but one quarter occur more than 250 kilometers away. Persistence. How long do people breathe this polluted air? The persistence of exposure, whether they are acute or chronic, makes a large difference in health outcomes. The strongest predictor for the three to four million deaths worldwide is chronic PM2.5 exposure over periods of a year or more. But short-term exposure to elevated levels of PM2.5 can also exacerbate lung and heart ailments, cause asthma attacks, and lead to increased hospitalizations and mortality. And finally, vulnerability. Individuals and communities have different vulnerabilities and adaptation responses. Some groups may be more susceptible to health impacts from air pollution because of lack of adequate access to health care or from existing health conditions such as diabetics. Basically then, two different communities exposed to similar levels of pollutants can exhibit different health outcomes. Our pollution study at UCS quantifies P, quantified PM 2.5 from cars, trucks, and buses across the country and across groups. That's the study I just talked about. In another study at UCS, we looked at strategies to reduce these emissions, and we focused on the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic region. Specifically, we focused on three strategies. One, improving fuel efficiency. Two, electrifying cars, buses, and trucks, and three, using lower carbon fuels. In this study called Decarbonizing On-Road Vehicles in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, first we determined how stringent these three strategies need to be to reduce CO2 emissions so as to achieve a 40% reduction by 2030 on the way to an 80% reduction by 2050 relative to 1990. For instance, how fast should the vehicle fleet electrify? How much biofuel should be blended in? Second, we estimated the costs and benefits of the three strategies. This included estimates of avoided health impacts from reduced NOx and PM2.5, co-emissions, remember, the double-edged sword. With less combustion of fossil fuels or combustion of lower carbon fuels, CO2 emissions, as well as local air pollutant emissions are reduced. This chart shows emissions for these three strategies in 2030, which together lead to a 37% reduction of CO2 by the year of 2030. The 40% reduction we aim at is relative to 1990. So the gray bar on the left shows the 1990 emissions for the sake of comparison. In a business as usual scenario with just current policies, emissions would be reduced by about 12%. That is shown in the red bar. Next are five blue bars. They refer to the reductions associated with our three strategies. The first and second small bars are reductions associated with increased fuel efficiency. The next two bars, light blue, are reductions associated with electrification, the largest share. The last darker blue bar are reductions associated with less carbon intensive gasoline and diesel. Summing all these reductions, we get to a 37% reduction, very close to the objective target of 40%. And now here's an equivalent chart for 2050. So we achieve a 78% reduction in CO2 emission from 1990 levels, very close to the climate target. Notice the importance of electrifying cars and light trucks, the light blue bar. In the second part of this same study, we estimated the cost and financial benefits resulting from the implementation of these three strategies. Look at the second row of the table. 
If we invest $24 billion in the three vehicle technology and fuel strategies by 2030, we will accrue benefits in avoided climate and health costs that make up for this investment. By 2050, the financial benefit of investing in vehicle technology and fuel strategy is over $150 billion. The last three rows show the avoided climate and health care costs of the three strategies for reducing emissions from vehicles. The monetized greenhouse gas road is the avoided environmental cost for reducing CO2. The monetized NOx and PM2.5 show the avoided damage estimates. This included the value of reduced morbidity and reduced premature mortality. In 2050, the net financial benefit, including climate and health, is almost $400 billion. We also estimated the state level PM2.5 and NOx avoided damage costs. Each column in, the, in, this, in these charts shows how many billions of dollars a state can save by 2050. And this is the total cumulative value from now until 2050 from avoided costs if the three strategies are implemented. As an example, for instance, New York State can save $3.8 billion in avoided health costs. So how do we get there? We, how, how do we transition? To a, to a clean and equitable transportation fuel future, given the high investment costs. We need the three st strategies that, that we studied, cleaner and more efficient vehicles, but we also need less driving, less congestions, we need improved transit, we need affordable housing near transit, we need walkable and bikeable people-friendly communities. The good news is that states have been working together to achieve this sustainable future. In December of 2018, a coalition of nine Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states and DC announced their intent to design a new regional market mechanism to reduce carbon emissions from transportation fuels. Proceeds from the program will be invested into low carbon and more resilient transportation infrastructure. And equity is a key consideration in the design of the process and in the investment decisions. In conclusion, PM2.5 is the largest environmental factor in the US, causing over 100,000 deaths per year, more than traffic accidents and homicides combined. Residents, you and I, can make a difference by choosing cleaner cars, taking transit, biking, and walking. But much of today's pollution comes from sources outside the direct control of individuals. In the absence of federal policies, we therefore need states to take action, regulate, set up incentives and other policies to clean up our transportation system. The two studies we did at UCS provide quantitative evidence of the need for such programs. And hopefully these studies will help inform and shape our future action to reduce air pollution and its inequitable exposure, as well as reducing global warming emissions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Cecilia. What a great presentation. Um, we'll be moving on now to Raquel's presentation in a moment. Um, right now, Cecilia has up the three reports um, and you can go to the website there at, U at UCS um, to, to look at the full reports too. Great, Raquel, waiting for your presentation to load and then we'll be with you in a minute. Hello, uh, so I will be presenting uh, on my doctoral research, a study on future global mortality from changes in air pollution attributable to climate change. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, my advisor, Jason West, and uh, other co-authors that work with us to uh, collaborate on this project. So as Cecilia just said, air pollution is a leading risk factor for global premature mortality. Uh, from estimates that you, ha you have here from the Global Burden of Disease Study for 2015, uh, we see that uh, ambient particulate matter, PM2.5, as Cecilia mentioned, is a cause for over 4 million deaths per year globally. And this is about 
8% of all premature deaths globally every year. Ozone, another pollutant of concern given its widespread negative impact, and I'm talking about ground level ozone, so ozone in the troposphere, is also responsible for a quarter million deaths per year. These deaths are from multiple uh, diseases, but Air pollution has been mostly related with lower respiratory infection and other infections in children and in adults with cancers, especially lung cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and chronic and respiratory diseases. So air quality and climate change are interrelated. Air quality affects climate change and climate change uh, due, due, due to changes in atmospheric chemistry and physics leads to changes in air quality. We know that ozone is likely to increase in polluted regions during the warm season, particularly in urban areas and during pollution episodes as climate change uh, affects our atmosphere. Ozone is also likely to decrease in some remote regions. And this is due to the effects on background ozone. Fine particulate matter, PM2.5, has more uncertain effects uh, related to climate change. And these effects are expected to vary regionally. There are different regional changes in precipitation, wildfires, and biogenic emissions that lead to uh, these effects being uncertain and these regional variations. So when we want to estimate premature mortality due to ambient air pollution, we need to take into account uh, several factors. One factor is uh, air quality modeling or other ways of estimating uh, air pollution in the atmosphere. And uh, another important factor are epidemiological studies that give us the relationship between exposure to air pollution and uh, mortality. So in order to get to our premature mortality estimates, we need to know uh, also the baseline mortality rates and when we are estimating mortality due to uh, air pollution, we consider these uh, specific causes of mortality because these have been related to uh, mortality due to air pollution. We also need to take into account the exposed population, the population that will be uh, exposed to this air pollution and will be thus uh, affected uh, in terms of mortality. And in the study I'm going to talk about, we consider only adult population. So in order to estimate air pollution concentrations, we can use different sources, but because our studies impact or relate to future air pollution, we really have to use air quality modeling. The other sources are usually used when you, we are looking into present day uh, and past uh, air pollution. Another important aspect is that because we're looking into the effects of climate change, we actually consider future uh, greenhouse gas emissions and future air pollutant emissions according to scenarios that were established by the international community. And they, these are called the representative concentration pathways. And these scenarios have been established uh, mostly to account for the effects of climate change, but they also have by necessity to consider changes in uh, air pollutants other than greenhouse gases. And one thing important to note here is that these scenarios have different expected or projected uh, CO2 concentrations, carbon dioxide concentrations, which will rise in three of the scenarios and decrease in another one. We will be focusing on this scenario of uh, increased uh, CO2 concentrations. Uh, in these scenarios, sulfur emissions, NOx emissions, and other air pollutant emissions 
are actually projected to decrease. This, of course, depends on air quality policy. And another uh, aspect to take into account is that for methane emissions, they are actually projected to increase in the scenario that I will be using for this study. Uh, for the other scenarios, they were projected to decrease. And this has to do with the different types of policy that the different scenarios take into account. So another thing to consider for this study, and I'm kind of laying the ground for the different aspects that in, will influence the estimates that I will present. We use data from the APMIP model ensemble. And this ensemble of different models uses different ways to look into the effects of climate on atmospheric chemistry and the interaction with the ocean. So this ensemble of models, this uh, set of models, includes chemical transport models that only look at the effects of climate on chemistry. They also have models that are chemistry general circulation models, which also account for the effect of the oceans. Others are chemistry climate models, where the interaction between chemistry and climate is accounted for. And finally, there's one model that's fully coupled, which means that all these interactions are taken into account by this model. And these models uh, reported simulations for 2030, 2050, and 2100. But for the purpose of isolating the effects of climate change, we only considered 2030 and 2100. So the research objectives for the study I'm presenting today uh, were uh, using modeled ozone and fine particulate matter concentrations from this ensemble of models I just mentioned, quantifying the global ozone and PM 2.5 related mortality impacts of future climate change. We also looked at uh, concentrations globally uh, in terms of both emissions and uh, climate change effects but I'm presenting just on the isolation of the future climate change effects by using pairs of simulations. One simulation with present emissions and climate and one with present emissions but future climate. So for air quality models, modeling, we considered climate change impact in 2030 and in 2100. We considered projected uh, baseline mortality rates to 2030 and 2100, and we considered uh, exposed population projected to 2030 and 2100. And as I mentioned, this was a global study. So here we can see two maps with the future impact of climate change in 2030 and in 2100 as given by the average of these uh, model that I just mentioned. So these maps, glo these global maps, show how mortality due to exposure to ozone affects different regions in the world. And you can see here that they are affected differently. You can also see from the uh, colors, the intensity of the colors, that in 2030, the impacts are quite minimal, they're very close to zero deaths per year, while in 2100, you can really notice much stronger effects. And this is, of course, because climate change will uh, have a much stronger impact on air quality by 2100. We can see here, for example, that ozone will lead to an increase in uh, mortality, this orange, uh, colors here, mostly in East Asia and India. Actually, in these regions, we expect a mortality increase of 41 deaths per year per million people in East Asia and eight deaths per year per million people in India. You can also see that in Africa, actually, it's more of a decrease in mortality that's projected. And this is related to the fact that climate change impacts these different regions of the world in a different way. In, the, in North America, 
it's projected to uh, have an impact of 13 deaths per year per million people caused by premature mortality due to respiratory diseases. So globally, we have over uh, 3,300 premature deaths per year in 2030 and over 43,000 premature deaths per year in 2100. This figure, 43,600 uh, 43, premature deaths per year, actually corresponds to an increase in 14% in global premature mortality. And this is just due to the exposure to increased ozone due to climate change. As for uh, fine particulate matter mortality, we see greater impacts. So we see total mortality uh, uh, with an estimate of over 55,000 deaths per year in 2030 and over 200,000 deaths per year in 2100. As I mentioned before, this is the average given by using an ensemble of models in the case of fine particulate matter we were able to use resu results from four or five models depending on the simulation year. And again, we see that mortality differs per region of the world. And in 2100, we project over 45 deaths per year per million people in East Asia, over 40 deaths per year per million people in India, but a decrease in uh, mortality in Africa. And this is likely due to increased precipitation caused by climate change, which will le leads to uh, removal from the atmosphere of this uh, particulate matter. And so a decrease in mortality due to particulate matter. In North America, again, we see an increase in uh, mortality due to uh, exposure to fine particulate matter. Now, one thing to take into account is that actually, due to decreases in emissions that are projected into the future, mortality due to per fine particulate matter should actually decrease. However, the global effect of climate change is leading to an increase in mortality due to fine particulate matter, which counters the effect of decreasing emissions. One important aspect from this research is that there's uncertainty in these results. And here in this plot, you can see how different models project different uh, estimates of mortality. And basically what you can see here is that actually using air pollutant concentrations coming from, I'm sorry, from um, two models, they actually lead to projections of decreases in mortality. However, if we look at the average of the models considered, then we see that there is actually a projected increase in mortality due to exposure to ozone. Another important aspect to consider is that uh, the isolated effect of climate change is uh, the result given here. So these are not global increases in mortality. Overall, it's just the effect of climate change. And thus, given this uncertainty when using uh, air pollutant concentrations determined by different models, this leads us to think that it's really important to use uh, different models so that we can estimate uncertainty in our average estimate. So in conclusion, climate change is likely to increase global premature mortality as given by the RCP 8.5 scenario. Increases occur in all regions except Africa, especially in highly populated and highly polluted areas. However, uncertainty in modeled air pollutant concentrations contributes to the most to uncertainty in mortality estimates. Therefore, 
we need to take into account that climate change mitigation is likely to reduce air pollution related mortality. Therefore, air quality and climate change policies should be better integrated. If they are, we can really get co-benefits from reduced uh, air pollution and mitigation of climate change. We can also consider the effects at a global scale and simultaneously the regional differences. And this brings me to the conclusion of my presentation and I welcome your questions. Great, thank you so much, Raquel. We're gonna hold for questions until the end. Um, but right now, Tony is pulling up his slides and he will begin in just a minute. Um, Raquel, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. And thank while you. we're waiting for Tony, uh, don't hesitate to type your uh, questions into the Q&A box. Some technical difficulties. We'll be with you in a moment. Um, feel free to ask those questions now in that Q and A box. And um, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Tony. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so the topic of my presentation today is air quality and the health co-benefits of diff different deep decarbonization pathways in California. Um, so first of all, I want to discuss some of the big broad background of our research. Um, so currently there are over 60 carbon pricing strategies across the world uh, being implemented or being proposed. However, we realize that none of the existing uh, carbon pricing strategy, whether it's uh, market-based or tax-based, have considered the impacts of co-benefits as uh, both previous um, uh, presenter mentioned. Um, but on the other hand, researchers are finding that uh, greenhouse gas reduction um, uh, usually accompany with uh, co-benefits, especially uh, from air pollution reduction and its associated health benefits. So uh, to, to go step further, we hypothesize that the selection of different deep decarbonization um, strategy and also policies may affect the level of co-benefit. And we believe it is necessary to understand how um, the selection of different uh, um, geotrim mitigation uh, strategy policies uh, can affect uh, the level of health co-benefit. And we believe this will uh, be helpful to inform future uh, climate policies. Uh, so talking about the, the, uh, our started region, so why we select um, California, why we uh, choose to figure out, to, to, to investigate the different uh, impact of different deep decarbonization strategy in California, because uh, California is a region with strong climate ambition and uh, environmental awareness. Um, as you can see from the uh, left-hand side, that um, in 2006, uh, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed a famous um, uh, AB 32, which is the first of its kind of regulations that require California uh, screen cost gas emission to be below the 1990 level, 1990 level by 2020. And in 2016, the SB 32 further extended the requirement and required California's GH emission to be um, below 40% of 1990 level by 2030. Um, on the other hand, uh, California also probably has the worst air quality in the United States. As we can see from the uh, right-hand side, that uh, almost every urban area in California are in non-attainment areas for PM 2.5 or ozone. And most of these um, regions are non-attainment area for both pollutants. So um, in fact, uh, California is a, is a region that has a strong desire to treat climate problem and air pollution problems simultaneously. Um, so that's, um, that's the reason why we um, uh, focus on California in this regional study. Um, so as I discussed, 
just now the purpose of our study is to investigate how different uh, deep decarbonization strategies can lead to different level of, of air pollution, air quality and health co benefit. Um, therefore, we, we have um, designed two extreme deep decarbonization cases. Uh, both of them meet the same uh, greenhouse gas reduction target, which is 80% below the 1990 level in 2050. So um, uh, because this is a, uh, this kind of uh, stringent target, um, uh, we, 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 we believe it's, um, no, it's, it makes it makes it so unique and novel compared to some of the previous studies uh, with milder milder uh, GH reduction goals. Um, but the key difference of the two scenarios is that they 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 uh, focus on different policy and technology tasks. The first deep decarbonization scenario we design design uh, intends to minimize the co emitted air pollutant emissions. So this scenario is intended to represent a, one policy consideration, which is to uh, try to uh, mitigate the climate climate change problem and the air pollution problem simultaneously. Um, on the other hand, the second uh, um, deep decarbonization scenario intends to minimize the implementation cost of uh, GH reduction and intend to uh, minimize its impact to the existing energy system. So this represents a different uh, policy consideration, which is uh, cost consideration. Um, and I also want to point out that uh, although I call them uh, two extreme deep decarbonization cases, uh, actually when we develop our uh, cases and select these two, we always make sure that our selected scenarios are, uh, our, our proposed scenarios are, uh, can be reasonably achieved within existing policy and uh, technology. And also they, uh, the existing natural resources can also support our scenario. So, although I call them extreme, they are all reasonably can be all reasonably achieved in the given time frame. Um, so here's a, a, a table showing um, how what kind of strategy are being implemented in the two uh, deep decarbonization scenario as well as the the, the business as usual. Um, as you can see that. Um, a, a number of different strategies should be implemented uh, into the two different the two deep, deep decarbonization scenarios. Although I said they they, they focus on different uh, as the, the uh, policies, this is because we are talking about the eighty percent reduction. It's very stringent, and uh, and therefore basically we need uh, to reduce as many as GHG emissions in almost every sectors. Um, the key difference between the two deep decarbonization scenarios is that the DD1 uh, mainly focus on electrification related strategy, especially in the transportation sector. Um, uh, this uh, uh, so by, by implementing the electrification strategies, it will also um, uh, eliminate the tailpipe emissions um, and reduce co-emitted air pollutant emissions. Um, being different from DD1, the DD to mainly focus on um, renewable fuels. Um, the, the, the advantage of renewable fuels is that uh, the implementation cost is cheaper than other uh, GH mitigation strategies. So we also, uh, we quantify the annualized cost of the two uh, scenarios in 2050. Uh, the implementing DD1 will uh, lead to an annualized cost of $53 billion and uh, DD2 will lead to an annualized cost in 2050 uh, of uh, 28 uh, billion dollars. Um, so after we designed the, the, the two scenario as well as the, uh, the business as usual scenario, we, we feed our um, policy, technology, and as other assumptions into our self-developed energy and emission technology model. Uh, which will give us, uh, uh, which will uh, project the, uh, the greenhouse gas emission and uh, air pollutant emission inventory uh, in 2050. And then we, uh, we feed this emission inventory into the, the WOF CAM, which is the uh, uh, atmospheric modeling tool to um, project the future uh, ambient PM2.5 and ozone concentration. 
So the, the PM2.5 and the ozone concentrate, the project the PM2.5 and the ozone concentration will be um, used to uh, estimate the, 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 uh, the health impact um, using the BAMAP tool, uh, which is the, a tool that can uh, estimate the, the uh, various uh, how, uh, how, uh, health, uh, health impacts associated with the exposure to uh, air pollutant. So in this study, we mainly focused on the uh, premature mature deaths associated with long-term exposure to ozone and uh, PM2.5. So here starts uh, the results of our uh, our project. So first of all, is the, the greenhouse gas uh, emission projections. As I have um, introduced before, uh, because we are talking about 80% reduction, uh, we need to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission as much as possible in almost every sector. So as you can see that the two, two, the two scenarios uh, uh, have a similar trend, a similar pattern in terms of GH reduction. Uh, the most reduction comes from transportation sector and the electricity generation sector. Um, but uh, in terms of the, 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 the air pollutant emission inventory, these, these scenarios, these two scenarios are quite different. Um, as you can see that although both DD1 and DD2 are showing uh, a, re a generally a reduction compared to the business as usual scenario, we see that DD1 actually has a much lower um, uh, air pollutant emissions uh, than the DD2 compared to the B uh, business as usual scenario, especially for PM2.5, the NOx, and the ROG or VOC. Uh, this is because that uh, when implementing the electrification related strategies, uh, the DD1 is able to uh, eliminate all, uh, all the tailpipe emissions or air pollutant emissions, but so DD2, uh, because it still burns um, uh, renewable fuels, uh, those air pollutant emissions are uh, still emitted. So we then feed this uh, air pollutant emission inventory into uh, the WolfCam to project the ambient air quality changes. Um, so we found that implementing DD1 uh, will, is like, uh, will like reduce the ambient PM2 point concentration in California by 17%, while implementing DD2 will only uh, reduce uh, 4%. Uh, in terms of ozone, the impact is much smaller. As we can see that implementing DD1 will only reduce uh, ambient ozone concentrations by 1% while implementing DD2 has an impact of less than 1%. But it's also noteworthy that uh, implementing reduced local emissions um, is likely to actually increase the uh, ozone concentration in metropolitan areas at, at, in Los Angeles and the San Francisco uh, Bay Area, as you can see in the, 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 the left bottom panel. Um, for some of you who are familiar with our region, uh, it's not surprising that uh, our uh, that uh, there are uh, a lot of studies um, talking that actually lo uh, reducing local emissions in these two metropolitan areas will actually um, increase the ambient ozone concentration uh, due to uh, the uh, the meteorology reasons. So we then feed this uh, air quality data into a uh, 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 the for, for health impact assessment. So overall, we estimate that implementing DD1 compared to BAU will reduce uh, 12,000 PM2.5 associated premature mortality, while implementing DD2 may only reduce, uh, um, not only, but it's a smaller number, uh, um, uh, by 3,000 uh, people, yeah, 3,000 cases in 2050. And in terms of the ozone, the, the health impact is much smaller than PM2.5. And in fact, because of the, um, the, uh, the negative impact I discussed uh, in Los Angeles and San Francisco Bay Area, and because of the, both of them are populous regions, um, uh, implementing DD1 may actually slightly increase the ozone associated mortality uh, in California. Then we, we combined the, the, the mortality uh, impact of uh, of the two of, of PM2 both both PM2.5 and ozone uh, of the two scenario and compared uh, with their uh, implementation cost, we found that implementing DD1 
uh, is likely to have a, a, a $25 billion, uh, billion dollar higher uh, annualized implementation cost in 2050. But it may also um, uh, provide much more health co benefits, and which equals about $84 billion. Um, so this implies that if 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 a if, 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 uh, government um, mainly considers like cost as their um, uh, limiting factor for developing climate change uh, climate change mitigation policies, they, they are very likely to generate a scenario which is similar to DD two, and if that's the case, then it's very possible that uh, um, that uh, the scenario will uh, neglect the the uh, the great uh, Health co-benefits. Um, instead, we believe it's uh, it's 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 suggested that uh, future uh, future climate um, uh, for future climate policies, uh, government should uh, also take into consideration of the the health co-benefit associated with the the different de decarbonization pathways. So to quickly conclude my presentation today, we found that in California, although GHG mitigation generally accompanied with improved air quality and health co-benefits. Uh, the level of co-benefits is that largely depends on the choice of GHG mitigation strategies. And therefore, policymakers may need to analyze the long-term air quality and health impact when developing future climate policies to, uh, to ensure maximizing the overall benefits of the, uh, the policy. Um, thank you. Great. Thank, you, thank you very much, Tony. Thanks, yeah. Tony. Uh, and uh, thanks to all of you for your presentations. Um, we're going to, we have some time now for uh, questions and answers. And please uh, type your questions into the Q&A box if you have them, and we'll go through them uh, now. Um, I think this first question is for Raquel. Uh, it's from Ron White. Do the ozone and PM 2.5 exposure response mortality functions selected uh, assume a threshold for mortality? So uh, the exposure response mortality function for uh, PM 2.5 is a superlinear model and so this model actually plateaus at high uh, concentrations of fine particulate matter and considers what they call a counterfactual of uh, 5.8 micrograms per cubic meter of pm 2.5 concentrations so yes there's a, a threshold there for ozone, we used a log linear uh, function, or actually we used results from a study using a log linear function. And uh, we did not consider uh, any threshold either for ozone or PM 2.5, because what we considered was a difference between a base case, a base case and a control scenario. So, in short, for ozone, we use the log linear model with no threshold. For PM 2.5, the model incorporates a threshold. In both cases, this threshold is not really uh, critical because we are using these differences in base case and control case. I hope this was Thank you. No, clear. that's great. That's great. Um, I, had, I had a question that came up uh, during the, the presentations, and that is, uh, I think uh, that Cecilia, you limited your uh, health uh, impacts to cardiovascular disease and some respiratory disease, and that while others mentioned cancer as well, and particularly lung cancer. Um, and so my question is, how do you estimate the percentage of lung cancers that are attributable to air pollution, uh, since we're now able to uh, take into account smoking prevalence in various census tracts and so on. So, so I, oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. This question is for Raquel, right? 
That's anybody, either of you, all three of you. I'm just yeah. curious so, about how you work in the cancer, lung cancer dimension. So I can actually uh, respond to the exposure response function I considered, and then it may not be the same that Cecilia did. So I, I guess she, she she could also contribute. But in our case, we used uh, results from a, a study by Burnett. Uh, and co-authors, and in this study, they actually integrated um, the relative risk of uh, mortality due to lung cancer and the other uh, health endpoints, considering actually different sources of air pollution. So there, that's why their model is called an integrated exposure response function, and it was uh, derived in a way that for uh, very high uh, concentrations, exp um, the relative risk would not continue increasing as if there, was a, there were always uh, additional effects. So uh, for this case, they actually took into account results from smoking as well in the way they built their model. Uh, I can send you the reference for their study if uh, anyone is interested. Uh, and for, for ozone, lung cancer is not, was not considered in our calculations, only chronic respiratory disease. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have anything to add to that, Raquel. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a question from Cynthia Mahoney. It's for Tony. Do you have any figures for the monetary value of DD1 and DD versus DD2 avoided healthcare costs? For example, hospitalizations, lost work days, et cetera, as opposed to the value of avoided premature mortality. In other words, what amount of money should be uh, struck from the budget or could be struck uh, from the budget? Yeah, I, I, I guess this is question is mainly about like what is the, the, the morbidity health care benefits of the, 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 the um, strategy uh, besides the, the mortality co-benefit. I think this is a very good question that when we uh, conduct the mortality study, uh, the co-benefit study, I think there are people will always ask like what's the morbidity. I think this is the, um, the, current, underst the current understanding uh, in this field is that the while um, Air quality, air pollution reduction, or may uh, result uh, may result in more, more, uh, mobility reduction and mortality reduction, and there are a lot of mobility health outcome associated with the, the, the exposure. But so the mobility impact, the first is like harder to synchronize. So it's 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 hard to to compare like what is one hospitalization means compared to one asthma cases. The only way to synchronize all the, to, to, to compare all the mobility impact and the mortality impact to co convert it into a money, money value. But uh, the, I think it's um, um, the current knowledge on like the, the monetized value for, for unit, the unit um, uh, mobility case is much considered much smaller than the, um, the, the mobility, mortality impact. And I, we didn't do a specific analysis in this study, but in a previous study we did, and also in many of the existing studies uh, in this field. Overall, uh, I think that for, for uh, like a, a similar scenario or similar task, the, mo the overall morbidity impact of, uh, in terms of PM2.5 is only 2%. I think it's one to 2% of the, all, all, the, um, all the health co benefits. In other words, like, a, uh, the 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 mortality impacts when converted into money values accounts for like ninety eight to ninety nine percent of the total co benefit. Uh, I don't know if this answers your question. It's not related to like which is more important. It's just the, the current valuing system, valuation system, like uh, will value uh, mortality much more than the mobility. Thank you. Um, Here's a question from Ellen Donovan. It's for Tony also. Are there any regulatory requirements in California to calculate the health benefits when doing ca uh, uh, climate adaptation mitigation? And how can we encourage cities or the state to include this type of, of analysis in their decision-making process? Well, I think, 
I, I don't know if there is any specific regulation that uh, uh, requires of like uh, um, California or any part of California do a specific health impact analysis the one for us uh, a specialized policy but I, but I, but I think in the recent uh, like SB 100 bill like signed by the former uh, Governor Jerry Brown last year in 2018. Uh, in in the in in that law and the ex the, the social executive order, he clearly mentioned that uh, uh, for future policies and uh, for future climate policy and uh, our our long term greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, the, the state government as well as the associated uh, agencies should consider the the, the health co benefit and especially highlight the the health impact to disadvantaged communities. Um, yeah, I think this will be a trend in the near future that the future policy should taking be, be starting to take uh, to to considering this factor. Thank you. Um, here's a question for any of any of you who'd like to address it. Uh, I noticed, for example, uh, that um, Raquel mentioned that there was a lot of regional variability and dependent on certain meteorologic conditions. Question is, in studying California, did you consider the climate-related increases in wildfires when looking at the impacts of uh, PM 2.5? Um, yeah, so actually, n I, I, we, don't, we don't consider the, 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 the wildfire effect in this specific, specific study because, because wildfire is a kind of an isolated uh, the, the, the isolated uh, situation. So in other words, you don't know how, how many wildfires will be in the year of 2050. We are, for, for projection study, we are mainly focusing on um, average year situation. Um, but uh, in a recent study, like we just published last month, we do, like, we do uh, consider the, the potential wildfire impact in California in terms of the existing um, like um, uh, health impact. And we believe wildfire is going to have a bigger and a bigger impact um, um, uh, in California in future because of the, 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 the vulnerability of the climate. Thank you. So I don't Go know ahead. if, uh, well, I was just going to say that Honestly, I don't remember exactly if any of the models in the ensemble uh, considered uh, wildfires, especially specifically in uh, California, because actually that's an interesting uh, reason why we think it's useful to use an ensemble of models to estimate uh, air pollutant concentrations and then derive uh, mortality estimates. It's the fact that different models uh, consider emissions from uh, natural uh, occurring wildfires or the impact of climate change in wildfires differently. And so it's useful to get estimates coming from different models because then on average, some of those effects will be considered. But as uh, Tony just mentioned, Projecting wildfires is extremely difficult and projecting the interactions is even more. So we are improving these models, uh, you know, as time goes by and we hope that projection, projected um, concentrations are going to be better and better. But there's one of the reasons why we have such uncertainty in, in, regional vari in, in the estimates of regional variability for, morta for mortality due to particulate matter. Thank you. Uh, Raquel, I had a question for you. Uh, can you explain uh, why you would expect background ozone levels to go down with uh, climate change in uh, remote regions? So I am not the best person to give you a really solid chemistry <laughs> response, but it has to do with the way uh, climate change affects ozone production and deposition in remote regions, which is affected by the, um, all the conditions in, in the atmosphere. And so while in polluted areas, warming 
is expected to actually contribute to an increase in uh, ozone in remote areas, different uh, conditions in terms of uh, chemistry and humidity, relative humidity, will, uh, is expected to cause a decrease in, in ozone. So I'm afraid I'm not, I haven't given you a really clear answer, uh, but it's related to the way uh, ozone is impacted by the different conditions in the atmosphere other than just increasing temperature. And in the remote regions, that happens because of the influence of the oceans as well. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, we have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, another question that uh, has occurred to me, and that is that each of you has uh, mentioned the importance of uh, electrification strategies, particularly in transportation, as being uh, changes that are necessary for addressing both climate and air pollution. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, that shifting our transportation to that extent towards electric vehicles uh, creates a kind of a chicken and an egg problem in the sense that uh, manufacturers have to uh, really tool up to provide that and they have to believe that there's going to be a market for these vehicles. Have any of you in your organizations thought about how to approach that strategically so that companies don't end up with a lot of stranded assets and things that people don't want to buy. Hi, I'll take that one. This is Cecilia. So the, the truth is that the manufacturer's platforms, manufacturing platforms um, are already at a level in which they, they are prepared for a pretty rapid electrification of, of the light duty vehicles, passenger cars and, and light trucks. Uh, and um, one example of this is how recently, um, you know, the, if, if you look at, at uh, the, the car manufacturers, they, the number of models that are, that are available uh, has gone up, gone up uh, you know, very, very fast. I don't have the numbers at hand, but I, I can provide them to anyone who wants them. Uh, and and so the the costs really have already been uh, taken into account, and 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 we also have a pretty good uh, you know, market. Uh, I we we have an idea of what the markets are going to be like. For instance, in our study, we we assume that by 2050, 90% of our passenger cars are going to be electrified. And that is, 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 that, is, that is a number that is not far from the target of most states. So most states are, 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 are including that kind of uh, number in their, in, their, in their plans. And so clear, and, and clearly they are, uh, you know, uh, talking about this uh, with, with industry and the situation is a little different with trucks, but it's also not not going so badly. The we we assume in our study a, a very reasonable number of uh, a seventy percent uh, totally electrified fleet of of small trucks, so it includes vans and you know single combination single unit trucks. And, but there are new companies coming up in the market that are are taking over the this area. For instance. There's, an, there's Rivian, um, who's already announced a uh, you know, light truck, a fully electric, battery electric light truck. So uh, things are moving, and I don't think there's any way to, to, that, that we can back out of this. It, it's definitely uh, happening, and uh, the, the auto manufacturers are, are mostly prepared. Some are more prepared than others, but in general, the, the, this transformation in the transportation sector is, is an accepted reality. Um, yeah, I don't know if we have uh, time, but I just want to add uh, a few things. So I think, uh, I'm not sure if there anyone come from EPA, but uh, I just want to bring up the, the, the recent uh, safe road crisis that uh, uh, California used to have uh, um, its uh, power to uh, uh, regulate the, the, the emissions, tailpipe emissions from the, 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 the automobile, but uh, uh, as some of you may know the news that uh, uh, the federal government is trying to uh, revoke uh, this uh, uh, to, 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 to remove this um, autonomy and uh, yeah.
So, so this will have an impact on the, the actual the effectiveness of our uh, climate change efforts because the, the proposed new rule has a, 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 a minor, a, a milder greenhouse gas reduction target for, for the car manufacturers. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end of the time and I want to uh, just thank you again for your presentations and the engaging uh, conversation and question and answer period. Uh, Hannah, I want to turn it back over to you to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Ted. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Chase website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska partnership call will take place tomorrow, October 16th, and is titled Threats to Drinking Water and Public Health in Alaska, The Scope of the PFAS Problem, Consequences of Regulatory Inaction, and Recommendations. In addition, we are holding our next Che EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, Beyond TEDx, next Wednesday, October 23rd. To learn more about RCP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to review, receive an, our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via a secure website at healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Cecilia, Raquel, and Tony for taking time to present today. And to Ted for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.